Okay, this is a lecture on queer theory. Uh, and I'm going to come at it in a probably rather unexpected direction, uh, but in keeping with what we have, uh, the, uh, the, the narrative, that thread that has been uh, throughout the whole course, or at least my attempt to put a narrative thread throughout the course, connecting different writers from different eras on similar topics uh, and uh, talking about how later writers uh, in their assertions will actually relate to previous writers, whether wittingly or unwittingly, and uh, to help us to try and understand uh, and think about literature, think about culture, think about uh, language in some ways. And I'm going to start with the uh, writer here who, and I'm going to spend most of the class talking about Michel Foucault, uh, the most significant of the queer theorists, uh, of which there are many, but he's the most significant. And the most significant academic, I think it could be reasonably stated in the past 40 years or so. He's the most cited all over the place, in part because he's so prolific, uh, and in part because he um, is not, doesn't restrict himself to literary theory, uh, engages in all manner of topics that uh, would be associated with other disciplines like sociology and psychology, um, history of institutions. He's interested in uh, the uh, intellectual history in some ways. Um, so although he gets called a post-structuralist by others, uh, he vehemently rejects th the uh, designation uh, because he's got something more ambitious than, in mind than what we saw with Roland Barthes, the death of the author, and so forth, which is just simply to attack meaning and our capacity to do that, really focused on a very limited uh, and very scholarly and rather abstract, and for most people rather uh, ridiculous assertion that we can't know who the author is. And I talked about Sean Burke's book, The Death and Return of the Author, as a sort of riposte, I'm using French vocabulary today, answer to uh, Mr. Uh, Foucault on, on his, uh, and, and Bart for that matter, with The Death and Return of the Author. Foucault is doing something much more ambitious. But I wanted to begin with a work which I don't usually do when I'm talking about queer, queer theory, but I thought it was uh, appropriate and helpful and even for my purposes connected me to this topic because my doctoral supervisor, the first book he had me read uh, when I started the PhD with him was this one by Michel Foucault, uh, The Order of Things, An Archaeology of the Human Sciences. And I was very puzzled by this the suggestion, why do you want me to read this and what does it have to do with what I'm interested in? Because I'd done my master's thesis with, with Tim and uh, it was on the second half of Coleridge Biographia Literaria, which is dealing with uh, the imagination. Wordsworth has the poet of the imagination, his theories of uh, what the imagination is, and how it plays out, and uh, so why am I reading Foucault? And uh, I, I started reading, I found it a very difficult book to read, and I'll explain why in a second here. But where I wanted to start with this is simply with the title of this book, because this is the translation of The Order of Things, which is a terrible translation, or it's certainly not a literal translation. The, the original is actually helpful and interesting, because if you know any French, les mots et les choses are the words and the things. And if, we, if you think about what we did last semester in relation to Augustine, we talked about race and signa, signs and things, and the way in which language, uh, its signifying function, uh, points to things, and there is a thing that underlies, undergirds all other things, namely God. And in Augustine's On Christian Teaching or On Christian Doctrine, his discussion of biblical language with respect to first to reading and understanding, but also with respect to teaching, 
is related to the relations of words and things. Or signs and things, and words are a type of sign. He just broadens out the, the sense of signs to things that will be much broader than simply words. But all words are signs. Um, and he will simply include things in scripture that are like rocks will have signification and, and water. Uh, and so not simply restrict it to words. But in general, it is about words. And Foucault, by writing this book, Les mots et les choses, is engaging with the same topic. And I thought, uh, it struck me as I was preparing for this, as I say, I've lectured on this before, that um, in some sense, this is a, he is engaging with the, with the same sort of topic in a very, very different way, with very different consequences. And I wanted to get into that a little bit here. But simply, the title itself uh, is significant there. Words and things, and how do they relate together? And because Foucault is going to suggest something that is, I guess, connected to structuralism and post-structuralism. The structuralists are saying here is the way the words refer, the signs and the signifiers and the signifieds are based on these binary relations. And the post-structuralist says uh, the things that they're signifying uh, that gives it meaning, we have no access to that any more than we have access to the author or his intentions or all of that sort of things. And it sort of all breaks down. Foucault actually agrees with that, but that's not his project per se. He's not, he's not limiting himself to simply the nihilism effectively that ensues upon the idea of the death of the author, which I said in uh, that class is a correlation of the death of God. Very interesting how the death of God proclaimed by Nietzsche in 19th century, uh, the human sciences of the 19th century, has resulted in the death of the author, the human author, in, in the 20th. I, I don't think it's accidental either. But Foucault is more interested in doing something with this concept. If words uh, ultimately are not signs, but are rather aspects of our ratiocination. Reasoning. But without ratio ratiocination, without words, without evidence, without proof, but it's a way, it's just a way of thinking. And so it's not limited by the delimitations specific to words, concepts, and so forth, but is more of a process of thinking um, and there, therefore subject to the nullification of thought, which I said was rooted in the uh, study of language as a human artifact by human beings in the 18th century, then a presentation of how words and things ought to work going forward is going to be characterized by that same sense of ratiocination. And let me just say something about that in relation to this book. This book is a book without footnotes. It has no footnotes. It has, a, it has no evidence per se. It doesn't try and prove its case. It argues its case. It has a sort of line of thought to it. Um, there's no proof, there's no method, there is no elucidation of the uh, methodology that he's approaching here even. He simply ventures upon it. And there's also no end notes here in it. There's, there's no index to the book. There's just simply a line of thinking, and as I say, the sub, uh, subtitle in Archaeology of the Human Sciences, which he claims he's going to present, he never presents. There is no actual disclosure of this thing. It's, a, it's just a meandering thinking process in which he claims that um, a type of thinking emerges in the 19th century, something he calls an episteme, which is a way of thinking about human nature. And, and, and this is the word from which we get epistemology, of course, which is what? Well, 
What's, a, what's, what's epistemology of philosophical discipline? Study of knowledge. Yeah, the study of knowledge. But that is, as it, from the philosophical vantage point, the study of knowledge and where it originates and how we can know, how is it possible and what does it mean to say that we know something. Under Foucault has a very different character than the word might suggest. For Foucault, an episteme is a type of a whole network of connections and relations that a, a whole era uses for the sake of power. He connects knowledge with power. In fact, he, he quotes Sir Francis Bacon saying that knowledge is power. He asserts it flatly and uh, says that in the 19th century in the project of the human sciences, the concept of man comes into being. Now, I, I've made heavy weather of this already on the course. And I've said there's a shift from the, from the foregoing eras the, all the way into the 18th century. But at, in the 18th century, the change starts to take place. And then in the 19th, there's a decisive shift away from the humanities towards the human sciences, the Geisteswissenschaft. And I've talked about that at, uh, ad nauseum here. And Foucault, traces it as well and he he says that he says that in this book that there is a shift from the way uh, knowledge had been categorized before away from grammar and natural history and an analysis of wealth in the classic period towards uh, philology and biology and economics in the 19th century for example and then there's an invention of whole new disciplines all altogether like psychology and sociology and anthropology. These are new emergent disciplines that are there to talk about humanity from a human perspective without any appeal to, to nature as a given thing or to history as a, a legacy of language by which we understand ourselves. They're trying to move away from all of that in the human sciences. And so Foucault and I are here on the we're on the same page in a sense that there's a decisive shift in the early 19th century. And he rather uh, extravagantly claims at that point, man is invented. And I think he's correct in a limited sense that the episteme of the human sciences is a total break from what had happened before, or it attempts to make a, a total break. It wants to no longer define human beings in terms of being in the, made in the image of God. It wants to uh, construct human nature from, a, from the vantage point of humanity. Um, and I, I've, I've described that already repeatedly and said that it's deeply problematic. It's inherent in the romantic view of the imagination, which is a, conceived as a faculty that we possessed uh, that effectively allows us to create out of ex nihilo, out of nothing, as if we were the authors of our own being, as if our thoughts originated in us, etc. And then we could conceive of human nature in a similarly um, theological presentation, like as if human beings had the capacity with their language to create a world. And um, I realize I'm jumping all over here, but another book came to mind while I was reading this, and this is a book I highly recommend to everybody by Oliver O'Donnell in Begotten or Made, in which he's talking about bioethics, interestingly, and noting a change in the language that we use to talk about human nature as well that's now gone into the sciences. And I think he's describing to some degree the exact same thing that, that Foucault is describing in the shift from the humanities to the human sciences. And he notes uh, a very interesting shift here, which I want to um, push on a little bit here. And I'm just going to read the first page of this. Uh, the, the title of the chapter is Medicine and the, and the Liberal Revolution. So begotten or made. When the fathers of the Council of Nicaea declared in the words familiar to every Christian who recites their creed that the only Son of God the father was begotten, not made. They intended to make a simple point. 
the Son was of one being with the Father. He was God, just as God the Father was God. And to emphasize the point, they used an analogy based upon our twofold human experience of forming things other than ourselves. That which we beget is like ourselves. I shall use the word beget as the ancients did to speak of the whole human activity of procreation and not in the modern ways, meaning uh, especially the male side of the activity. It's the whole human activity is begetting. It's not just what the man does. Our offspring are human beings who share with us one common human nature, one common human experience, and one common human destiny. We do not determine what our offspring is except by ourselves being that very thing which our offspring is to become. Just so, remember it's an analogy, the Father said the eternal being, the eternal Son of God, who was not made, was of the Father's being, not his will. But that which we make is unlike ourselves. So when the Father creates, he creates like himself. He begets. But when we create, we create things unlike ourselves. Now this bears on words and also the anthropology, the pseudo-anthropology that Foucault is going to construct. But I'll come back to that in a sec. Whether it is made of matter like a wooden table or of words like a lecture or of sounds like a symphony or of colors or shapes like a picture or of images like an idea, it is the product of our own free determination. We have stamped the decisions of our will upon the material which the world has offered us uh, to form it in this way and not in that. What we make then is alien from our humanity. In, in that it has a human maker it has come to existence as a human project. It's being at the disposal of mankind. It is not fit to take its place among, alongside mankind in fellowship, for it has no place beside him on which to stand. Man's will is the law of its being. That which we beget can be and should be our companion, but the product of our art, whatever immeasurable satisfaction and enjoyment there may, bo may be both in making it and cherishing it, can never have the independence to be the other I, equal to us and differentiated from us. So there's a difference between begetting and making, and a dissimilitude there as well as a similitude. And uh, I, I encourage you to read Donovan, O'Donovan's book. I think it's fantastic and extraordinarily helpful in thinking through these things. But what he is talking about here is the way in which, and I'm going to apply it then to the use of language, when we, when the Romantics claim that the imagination bodies forth or creates images or ideas or imagines things that didn't exist before and claims quasi-divine powers to do so, it's claiming that it, we are effectively emanating from us something that is a godlike power. And Foucault correspondingly speaks in terms of knowledge and power. He doesn't recognize the difference between begetting and making. There's a, there's a confusion of categories all around here. And um, I don't think it's for uh, without, uh, it's not accidental that in the uh, 1970s that French academia went off the rails in some ways and were promoting some really odd things, and I'll, I'll, which I'll talk about in relation to this uh, notion of queer theory as well. But a, a comment or question? Sorry, Don. You said Foucault acknowledged that that uh, way of viewing the imagination started with the Romantics, or did it? Like, he doesn't talk about the Romantics. He just talks about it in the project of the human sciences. Uh, he, he explicitly does that. But the, um, the human sciences get it from the romantic notion of human nature, for sure. Yeah, he doesn't talk about that, particularly doesn't talk about the romantics. He's more interested in, in what the social scientists do with that. And I, I just say that the human scientists codify what the romantics believe is true about human nature, ma namely that we imagine ourselves out of nothing, more or less. The, the thought is what originates human being and not 
any, any uh, pre-existing God or an analogy or something we can appeal to there. We're rethinking who we are in accordance simply with thought. And, um, and so this is a very uh, interesting um, and really odd venture. And when I read this book by Foucault for the first time, I have to admit to you, I was baffled. I could not, where is he coming from? Where are the footnotes? Where's the evidence? Where's the proof? How can I trace whether what he's saying is correct or incorrect? Because if what he's saying is correct, this is extraordinarily interesting, but I would like to maybe go to the sources myself and be able to follow and track his thought and not simply think that he's correct just by virtue of pure assertion. But I'm not going to find it and I will never find it because there is no such thing. And he's not interested in such thing because it's a very different approach. The difference between rationalism and empiricism in some ways. Empiricism is going to allow you to follow the processes. You read the authors, you say, is this legitimate or illegitimate? There's no legitimacy depends on words and not on a rational, ras, uh, ratiocination process. And, so the, and this is the problem and the frustrating thing for English academics when reading French uh, writers is that they um, don't feel like they can even engage with them. You're not giving me enough here. You might be correct, but you might absolutely be absolutely crazy. And either way, you're not following uh, academic conventions sufficiently for me to take you seriously. So what do I do with this? Anyway. Yes. Um, it's, I, I remember reading one of the first readings we had, what is hermeneutics about, he actually quotes Foucault. And there is in Foucault um, a, a great deal of, I, I, I heard he studied Hegel, and, and in Hegel's own phenomenology, he appears to use the same sort of um, thinking process where it's sort of a meandering of thought and he doesn't have any footnotes, but he's moving no, he doesn't. concept to concept, and he's sort of unfolding thoughts. <coughs> That's why the, the Germans and the French are called rationalists, and the English called empiricists. Is Foucault following that sort of method and assumption of thinking? He's not, a, he's not following the Hegelian methodology of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Okay. That's the progressive methodology, that this will lead to that. He talks about epistemes uh, emerging in periods and then one just e evaporating and being replaced by a new one. It's a little bit like uh, Thomas Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions or whatever it was called. I think that's what it was called. That there's a sort of episteme that emerges and then it's replaced by a new one. But, it, it, but there isn't a necessary sense of progression. That's, it's inherent in Hegel. But Hegel is providing the template insofar as Hegel is appealing to the spirit rather than the word. It's always that. It's, and, and, and because of that, if you're insisting on evidence and you're insisting on words, the words and things, then you're, you're following the wrong process here. Because it's really the reason and the things. And the reason uh, transcends words. And this is why R.V. Young's book at war with the word I think is correct in its basic assertion that um, English literature and broad, more broadly the humanities and even more broadly still the whole of the university world now to some degree, uh, it has moved away from proof and evidence uh, and matters of dispute through words towards commitment to a process that uh, you just simply are on board with or against, and if you're against, then you're said to be anti-scientific and irrational. Because to follow this is rational, but to oppose it is irrational, but reason is now not connected with evidence and proof mm -hmm. and with logical contradiction. Those would be the laws of logic. So the, it, again, it's a sort of reasoning that does not admit to contradiction. Because <laughs> that's, that's what words do. Say, yes, but this word doesn't mean that word, and, you can't, and when you say this, you're contradicting yourself and we've got to stop there. Um, this sort of approach doesn't admit to that stopping. And it is, th for that reason, I think it's more, it's closer to propaganda than anything else. Yes? Um, is, so 
because the epistemes emerge and evaporate, would it be based all on a principle of spontaneity? Well, it seems to be. I don't think that Foucault appeals to spontaneity. He appeals to power. And it's connected to knowledge. But he doesn't appeal to spontaneity in the same way that um, in the 18th century and in Kant's philosophy, he appeals to a spontaneity, which is, a, to me, a, the weirdest mm -hmm. thing. You know, it ha how does this happen? Well, it's spontaneity, I, in other words, I can't explain it, it just boom, happens. But it is probably implicit there. Uh, so it's an explanation for, I can't explain it, but it happens. But he does appeal to the episteme, and in particular, the concept of man emerging in the 19th century, invented around 1800. And, and for his, from his vantage point, from Foucault's, a, an episteme that's on the cusp of disappearing, and a new one will take its place, but which he doesn't then describe, which is also odd. But the reason he says that it's going to disappear is he, his presentation of the episteme of the human sciences beginning in 1800 all the way up until the time he's writing is predicated on certain views of human nature, among other things, heteronormativity and so forth, and certain presentations of, of knowledge and power that are meant there to discipline and punish. I, and so he writes an, an archaeology of the institution of the prison in which he talks about uh, the panopticon of Jeremy Bentham. Have you heard of the panopticon? I've talked about it in... And the prisons are based on this as well. So, there you go. Design of an institutional building with an inbuilt system of control originated by the English philosopher and social theorist Jeremy Bentham in the 18th century to allow all prisoners of an institution to be observed by a single corrections officer. So it's created here, and there's one that was actually built in Cuba here. Um, I think this is it, but maybe it's not. So the prison guard is at the center, and he can look in on all of this. So the prison tower in the center, and around it, the prison cells open glass walls you can be watched simultaneously and prisons are constructed in uh, in accordance with this idea and here it is in Cuba the Presidio Presidio Modelo there you go this is built on the panopticon model the idea that you are being punished not by torture but by surveillance constant surveillance to, um, and, and maximizing the use of knowledge and power at all times to control all of life. It's inherent in the project of the human sciences is try and rationally control all things and keep them in order from a centralized posture. And he says that this, this institutionalization of the human sciences results in a distortion of society accordingly in a dehumanizing fashion. And the prison here is a great illustration of it. So this is this, the Presidio Modelo in, in Cuba. And the prison guard here is in the center. And as you say, the prison cells glassed in here allow the, the prison warden or whoever it is here to watch them all at once. You don't know if he's looking at you, but he could be. And with cameras, would be. And the camera will allow an intensification of this process. And to some degree, I, I've argued uh, that uh, Wi-Fi and cellular technologies allowed precisely that sort of same presidio panopticon to be uh, non-localized and simply you carry it around with you and it's, it's listening in on you, watching you, big brother to some degree is with you. That's what's going on, right? Uh, Foucault is describing the episteme of the human sciences to have this dynamic of wanting to control all things for the greater good, to maximize pleasure, to maximize the utility uh, of people. But, but in order to do that, we have to give ourselves over entirely to the power of the scientist. 
and his gaze and his determinations. And so he writes a whole hi history of sexuality. Uh, he writes a history of the prison. Remember the prison as, as an institutionalized thing is an initially uh, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, its aim is rehabilitation. You're going to go into prison for a while and you will reflect on your crimes and you will be rehabilitated and you'll emerge out of it. It's sort of a monastic type thing. You're sequestered from the human population for a certain time. And, um, and, and emerge out of that a better person, which is belied by the statistics, which show basically the exact opposite. People who go in come out worse. The only advantage of imprisoning them is that they can't commit cr the same crimes outside of prison, so it is there to punish them, but does it actually correct them? Um, most people say that it's arbitrary and that uh, the, the prisoners are not only uh, treated inhumanely, they end up coming out worse than when they went in. And they're not rehabilitated in any way, which then begs the question of what are we doing in our penitentiary system? That's what I was looking for, that word. Penitentiary system. Isn't that an interesting? You can call it a prison. That has the connotations of a jail, a cell. But penitence is inherent in the penitentiary system. You're there to rehabilit be rehabilitated. How does the rehabilitation take place in a prison like this? Through constant surveillance. You can't, uh, you can't even begin an illegal act or an evil act because you're being watched, surveilled all the time. And eventually that will have a corrective effect on the human subject that's being watched. So how does this all come back to this? But that, that idea of an episteme beginning in the, where is the book picture that I have in there? There you go. Uh, he says that knowledge organizes itself under the guise of the human sciences in just this way, that it is a prison house of sorts Uh, that will exert a sort of power relationship, a power dynamic upon its human subjects, whether it wishes uh, to do that or not. And I'm going to have to dig down a little bit on what he means by that, because when you, when you think of Foucault, you don't think about what I'm saying here. You think about uh, his connection. He does mention epistemes, yes, but more his, his use of uh, appeal or his phrase knowledge is power and now you get it in the sense of the presidio model that I've shown there what he means by that a certain view of human nature from the vantage point of the scientist being wielded to exercise power and control over all things he will say that it isn't just true in the prison it's also going to be true in the area of sexuality it's also going to be in throughout society there's an implicit force being or power being exerted and so he's going to dig down on what he means by by uh, knowledge and what he means by power let me start by what he means by power uh, power is not an institution he says in the history of sexuality and it's not a structure and neither is it a certain strength we are endowed with it's not something that a person possesses and uses at their will to dominate others it isn't binary. So then the post-structuralist take on it is, uh, falls flat with, with some people having power, like a king. A king has power, whereas his subjects don't have power. So it's not about domination and control per se, and it's not necessarily negative. It's, and in fact, here's the problem. He doesn't ever define, <laughs> define power. He says what it's not. I don't mean by this. I, what he means is it's not a specific thing. It's not a in specific individual. It's not a specific institution. Rather, it is a um, multiplicity of force relations. 
Because if it was just somebody in power, or it was an authority, or it was an agency, or if it was a government, or if it was a person, you could say, we just need to remove that person from power. And that would solve the problem. He sees power being exerted from a thousand different directions by different people, some of them explicit, some of them implicit. So it's a fluid shifting, changing set of relations there, not just, um, and, and most importantly, he says that it's something that is exercised, not possessed. In fact, it only exists in exercise, in activity. And it's not possessed in a personal way, it's exercised and impersonal, he even says that it's impersonal. So it's a sort of an action. And furthermore, he, he, second feature of power, in addition to the fact that it's a multiplicity of force relations, he says that it's a complex strategical situation. So it's a whole variety of things. He delocalizes it. He removes it from the confines of a word or a concept or an institution and says it pervades everything. Power is everywhere and it's exerted everywhere in a complex way. And so um, the way we conventionally looked at it before the 19th century, as I say, come the 19th century, I think things go crazy. And we live in the wake of that. So that's why our world's so crazy and chaotic. But traditionally laws and regulations, legislation through words, from edicts, through governments, through, um, through rulers um, are established by sovereign governments, whatever the nature of the sovereign government, is it a king, is it a republic, is it a democracy, the elected officials, whatever, are cited as an example of power. But he sees these, no, those aren't power, those are coded force relations. They're just codified. And they can be checked in accordance with codes and in accordance with words. So then you can take the government to court over its use of uh, the abuse of its authority because it's, it's, it's breached its limitations. You're, the limitations of the law gave you the power to do this, but you have overstepped your boundaries. And I'm gonna sue you, take you to court. That will only hold true if words have uh, relate to things and words have definitions and limitations upon them and we accept them. But if we accept the postulate of the human sciences that words don't have that power and the real power resides in the spirit and in reasoning, then that will no longer hold true. The words don't have the power. So it's an attack again in the word on the illegitimacy and potency of the word as, and to some degree Foucault is um, agreeing with R.V. Young's assertion that we're at war with the word. So the sovereign governments who produce these laws are, are sources of power, but they aren't, they aren't power. They aren't principalities in the same uh, traditional sense. So we need to think of institutions, Foucault says, from the vantage of force relations. Force relations, they're not the source of power. And why? Because power is everywhere because it comes from everywhere. Every, power comes from everything and everywhere. So he delocalizes it and to some degree follows the uh, trajectory of the way thought is conceived uh, in the Geisteswissenschaften as a spiritual exertion, not limited by words. comes from everywhere. Now knowledge is intrinsically uh, related to power and they're connected. Knowledge is always an exercise of power. So here's the important point related to this course. Knowledge is always an exercise of power. He even goes so far, Foucault, as to say that the two are one and he, he presents them basically as a, with a hyphen or a, almost as a, 
one thing. Knowledge is power. Put an equal sign between them. And they come together in what he calls discourse or discursive formation. And what Foucault's entire intellectual project is concerned with is, un is uh, uncovering the effective operations of discourses within all of the various disciplines of the social sciences. He wants to show how discourse, that is knowledge, exerts power through these disciplines, say psychology, sociology, anthropology. He wants to trace the power dynamics in the way the fields organize their knowledge. And again, the English translator does what all translators try to do is to make sense of the enterprise, and so he calls it the order of things, although it, it misrepresents that, the, the title because it's the words and the things. And which is a more uh, amorphous, disorganized way of presenting it, whereas this is a very orderly thing. It suggests an order, an ordering where, where Foucault is suggesting um, almost the opposite. There is no order, but there is power, because we asso associate order with definitions and limi limitations. So discourses aren't just a st uh, string of statements they're systems of knowledge that create unequal power relations. Okay, so this is an important point. They create unequal power relations. And how do they do that? By deeming what is acceptable and conversely what is unacceptable. What is true and what is not true. What is desirable and what is undesirable. And so they are, these are ways of knowing or understanding something. So there's a power dynamic which he says differentiates and informs the knowledge that, that is called knowledge. But it's not rooted in right and wrong and true and false per se. Those are just simply uh, words that are used to exert power. It, now it's not a matter of truth or falsehood. And the whole uh, academic enterprise connected to words and human words being a function of, as I said, from a Christian vantage point, the fact that we bear the image of God and use words and understand through words and can debate through words and we can, can confute false ideas through logic, that is being replaced by the understanding of words being an expression, not just of an episteme, but of discourse, discourse whose whole purpose is to exert power. That's it. So he, he changes the academic enterprise from being one about knowledge and uh, uh, dominion in a limited sense under God's authority to being one of uh, expressing power through words. And as I say, because he's so effective, as evidenced by the citations that you'll see for, for Foucault for the last 40 years, the academy thinks that the intellectual life is now about power. That's, a, that's what it is. So discourses are a way of understanding and knowing something. And so he, they arise most obviously in academic disciplines and they define the parameters of the disciplines. They'll say, well, this, this is philosophy and this is not philosophy. This is literature, this is not literature. This is biology, this is not biology. They'll, they'll say, this is what we do and this is what we don't do. And post Foucault, the boundaries between disciplines start to collapse, disintegrate, because they accept the premise that knowledge is power and uh, that the limitations are some sort of abuse of power. More importantly, it's an unequal power relations. Those that hold the, the the keys to the disciplines are effectively um, power mad and crushing those that are outside the, uh, they're, they're, they're determining what will be considered scientific in their field. So the historians, the philosophers, the sociologists, um, he's going to dismiss their uh, legitimacy in favor of a, 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 an appeal to power as explaining everything, power dynamics and unequally wielded. 
and they also spill outside the academy then in society at large. He's also at pains to demonstrate that. In social norms, through accepted forms of uh, behavior, through uh, scientific understandings, through appeals to evidence and so forth in public discourse and so forth. So it spills over from the academy into popular um, uh, actions and people simply accept that this is true and this is not true. And they frame themselves in accordance with those who are uh, the framers of knowledge or in Foucault's understanding, the wielders of power. So academics become all powerful, more or less. And so the, in the history of sexuality, uh, Foucault will use the societal norm of believing that we as humans have a sexual nature and that this sexual nature can only be accessed through speaking about it. Uh, declaring our sexual nature, possibly with the assistance, uh, assistance from experts. And so he, he connects confession of sin or in relation to sexual sins with a form of power. And confession then is actually a way for somebody to confess their sins is a way for them to be dominated and controlled and disempowered by those who have determined what they do to be a sin. Even the confession, the confession is, is actually the most uh, powerful thing that uh, demonstrates this dynamic of knowledge exerting a sort of power on people. They're confessing that what they've done is a sin and that destroys the legitimacy of the act that is done. So they don't know, it's not that um, if you confess a sexual act that is considered to be a sin. Um, sex outside marriage, homosexual practices, bestiality, I mean, you name it. You confess that as a sin, what you're not doing is, what Foucault's certainly not doing, is thinking in accordance with a, uh, a Christian understanding of that, is that you're recognizing that you're distancing yourself from that, you're seeing yourself as the actor in that, but rejecting the action and trying to remove yourself from it and trying to come back into unity with God who's holy in his character. That's why you confess your sin. Foucault conceives it rather differently by acknowledging it as sin. You are actually being disempowered and crushed by a view of power that dehumanizes you in the process. And so because of this, they're going to want to get rid of categories of sin and with the whole practice of confession because it's fundamentally disempowering and they won't allow you to use language that would suggest that there are certain acts that are licit or illicit, moral or immoral, which confession would acknowledge. So with, the, with your mouth, you're confessing what you're, with your bodies you did. And what, by confessing it, you're no longer going to act in the same way. That is what he does in the history of sexuality. So, and he says that society is formed around this genealogy of confession in as much as we've unthinkingly accepted that we do have a nature of sexuality and that it can only be and must be exhumed through speaking about it with the help of those who know what they're talking about to confirm what we may think. Well, who are those people who know what they're talking about? The priests. We don't have a sexual nature, says Foucault. We've accepted the authority of the church on our sexual nature. All they're doing is wielding power over us, which I am, as a thinker, going to reject. And because of this, he says that our sexual desires are transformed into discourse and we are, fall into the dominant way of looking at this, in which homosexuality is considered to be a immoral act. Comments or questions? So this is a, an example of power at work through knowledge, through, just through the act of confession. Right? So you can see what he's after. Now he, he, so his history of sexuality is very interesting in three parts. Discipline and punish, where he talks about the institutionalized, uh, the prison system and so forth, the penitentiary system. Very interesting. 
uh, the word work that I looked at initially, the order of things was interesting for me, it wouldn't be for most people, because he talks about how language had pre uh, hitherto worked in terms of representation and in terms of imitation even. Remember mimesis and imitation and representation and analogies and the presumed analogies, the way literature works is through the analogies that take place between a microcosm and a macrocosm. It goes back as far as Plato the assumption that a human being in some sense relates to the polis and is a little world and that there are relations between the two which we can follow by imitation by representation Foucault is wants to break with all of that and see that even that whole project of understanding through imitation representation through language to understand the world and relate to other people as a as really a, a disguised form of power being exerted. Now, where does all this go? Are you following me so far? Because this is sort of complicated, and I'm trying to bring this tiger into some sort of discernible thing. But I think connecting it with his objection to confession is helpful insofar as it illustrates what he's after. Now. How does this connect to the project of, uh, what did I call it, queer theory? Yes. Peter Sandlin's book, which I read years ago, Plastic People and what he writes, How Queer Theory is Changing Us, is not a book, it's just a little booklet, and he engages with Foucault um, at considerable length, is not really about homosexuality. It's more about the way of thinking about language, which is what he's interested in. And, and, and the title is very helpful and informative, Plastic People, as if a person was a malleable, infinitely, um, a shapeless, formless, natureless entity that we could form in accordance with our desires, in accordance with our use of our own language to gain power over ourselves. And he says that sort of use of language is creeping into all areas of life. It's not against homosexuality, although Foucault is a homosexual who died of AIDS in 1984, the first French uh, public figure who died of AIDS in 1984, or GRIDS as they used to call it. Before they rebranded it, it was a little bit too specific and because um, it was a gay it was called the gay disease at the time. And GRIDS described exactly what it is. Let's change it to AIDS. It's an autoimmune disorder. Yes, it's an autoimmune disorder that um, that community particularly seemed to suffer. And they say, well, not only, it's not only gay people that get AIDS. And I'm, well, that's true. But it is particularly prevalent in this particular community, which is why it was labeled that way. Um, but AIDS is unobjectionable in the sense that it is an autoimmune di disorder and so, so forth. Anyway, um, but he dies of AIDS in 1984. And furthermore, and more interestingly and probably alarmingly, he was one of the signatories of a petition in the 1970s that was uh, trying to remove the limitation on um, sexuality in relation to various things. And I'll put the petition here just so you can see it. It's in relation to age of consent laws in the late 70s. Signed by basically every French literary theorist that we can. Petition 1977 in Le Monde. Criticized the affair de Versailles. Three men arrested for nonviolent sex offenses against children. Petitioned the French parliament. Published in Liberation, of course, Liberation, Radical Left. Uh, defendant man arrested for sexual relations with, the, with girls 6 to 12. Age of consent was differed between um, uh, males and females, furthermore. There was a, um, the prohibition against sex with minors was a, was a lower age with boys than it was with, as in same sex relations than with girls. Same laws in Canada, by the way which were removed uh, by appeal to equity in the same sort of petition against age of consent laws. Have, but, but let me just go to cut to the chase here. 
Michel Foucault argued that it's intolerable to assume that a minor is incapable of giving meaningful consent to sexual relations. Intolerable to assume that they're incapable. Foucault also believed consent as a concept was a contractual notion, in other words, a rational one, and it was on the basis of a case by case, and that it was not a sufficient measure of whether harm was being conducted. Foucault, Sartre, and newspapers such as Liberation and Le Monde each defend the idea of sexual relationships with minors. So, relation of power and knowledge and definitions in relation to sexual actions, which seem to be what we would call motivated reasoning. Motivated by something other than the process of reasoning, but, uh, but motivated by desire. Foucault furthermore was um, uh, charged with sexually abusing boys in, Tun in Tunisia a few years ago. Accused of being a pedophile rapist, whatever. I don't know if it's true. I have no, I have no problem uh, believing that it could be true. Given the petitioning in the 1970s of the French intellectual establishment against the um, definitions of consent and the definitions of pedophilia and, and so forth, and the organizations that arise in the 1970s, with the same sort of motivation of getting rid of the terms of knowledge, that is words that will define what a minor is and what consent is and so forth. By the way, the sex ed curriculum in, in here in Ontario, which I opposed publicly in the National Post, I pointed out that, that, that the, not just that the architect Ben Levin had similar sorts of issues, but, uh, but that he, he was uh, the age of consent and the idea of consent, the sex ed curriculum was, was couched in terms of consent based. So children are being taught from an early age what their sexual nature is and what it means to give consent. That's what they're being taught. And now the question is, is consent, can it be given by somebody who is a minor and why, what does it mean to be a minor? or to have attained an age of majority. What does that mean? Foucault believed that consent as a concept was a contractual notion, and it wasn't sufficient, a sufficient measure with harm was being conducted. That's what the sex ed curriculum also asserts. It asserts the exact same thing. And so what the project uh, then says is then, well, if that is the case, to prevent harm, we have to inform the children what it means to give consent. And then we're giving them sufficient, uh, we're giving ourselves sufficient legal backing that um, they've understood because they've been taught it in the schools. Some people call this grooming. I don't think it's quite grooming. I think it's a recalibration of uh, the way, the very way we think about these things towards an, a, a non-defined power dynamic and words as the expression of that and thus there's an objection to any definitions. So I'm not quite so in, in, the, in the conservative camp of which I will be associated, there's an objection to this as grooming and of uh, promoting pedophilia and so forth. I think that's true by the way, but I also think that there's more at stake here and I'm more interested in that from an academic perspective, what is going on here is, is that um, there's, a, there's an intention in the legislation to remove definitions as a way of holding people accountable. And for getting rid of the idea, for example, of adulthood and childhood. And you can do this in various ways. You can get rid of uh, the dif distinctions between boys and girls, you, which is a definition. You can get rid of a distinction between adult and children, which is a definition. Uh, you can get rid of the idea of harm, which is a definition. What do we mean by harm? All of these things are going to be open game if 
we are disputing the nature of human nature, the authority of a family, for example, in the discussion, or whether we just have autonomous individuals, which is how the uh, human sciences see it, and Foucault sees it, and uh, the establishment sees it, do we have just autonomous individuals expressing their will, their choices, which we ought to liberate them from the oppressive discourse of the world that will delineate differences between adults and children in relation to their sexual nature. That's the strong push. But that's just the area where we, it becomes uh, hot, where the, the debate becomes hot. You know, you're abusing children, et cetera, and there's no doubt that that's happening in rampant ways. Which there are films out now that demonstrate um, huge pedophile rings um, and, and the abuse of children on this front. But, at, but here in, in this class, my concern is more how language is being conceived in the whole process and how it relates to human nature. Because it's one thing to object to the outcome, it's another to say this is fundamentally wrong, not just in a, on occasion wrong. And yes, we need to do better next time. Yes, when the child said, um, Afterwards, he did not agree to being sexually abused, but at the time didn't give indications of the consent. How do we prevent that from ever happening again? Well, we have to teach him what it means to be con consenting, and then we're, you know, we're off the hook. Question then, can a child give consent? Can a child give consent? What does it mean to give consent? Consent means just say, okay, right? But if you, do you have the capacity as a child to give consent. What would it mean? What does it mean? Why do we talk about historically an age of majority and age of minority? What does that mean? How can we have voting laws at certain ages and not others? Why do we have uh, driver's license at certain ages? Why do we have uh, prohibitions on consumption of alcohol as minors and not as adults? What, I mean, all these timelines, why are they there? According to Foucault, they express their use of power through determinations that come from um, discourse that is oppressive because it limits uh, some things, it sanctions them, says that they're wrong, requires us to publicly confess it in certain ways, act accordingly. Uh, can we actually hold that a child is a child? How will we hold to that? That then becomes the issue and it, then it becomes related to human personhood and human development. Um, if you're an evolutionist, you have a great deal of trouble making the distinction between adults and children. They're all just organisms at different stages of development. But what's the, what's the age when maturation takes place and responsibility takes place? In the consent-based sex ed curriculum, the child is being taught consent as if the child could give consent. But I argued that a child cannot give consent because a child doesn't know the consequences of words and actions. They can't. They're under the responsibility of their family until they reach the age of maturity. We can see it biologically even in terms of uh, puberty, right, where there's a development from a child to an adult, male or female. You go through the puberty cycle and now you can have children yourself. Before you can have children, you are a child. Once you can have children, that surely must be one sort of sign of an indication of a, sh a shift from a certain period of life to another. And human development is a very funny thing. Uh, children, human children do not uh, mature at anything like the rate of any other animal. There's nothing, there's no correspondence, there is no analogy in the animal kingdom. It takes, uh, people's brains are allegedly developing when I say allegedly, I've read and don't know well enough until the age of 25. Uh, physically, they're maturing at a, a quicker rate. Morally, they're maturing at a, at a slower rate, moral development. And moral development will be part of consent. The moral consequences of the sexual act have to be known for consent to be given in a legal, socially helpful fashion. And it's not just that I know what I'm doing is a sin or not. It's that the consequence of what I do might result in 
having children for whom I will be responsible or somebody will be responsible. Someone must be responsible because human beings as they are, are not like little colts that they can stand on their feet and totter around an hour later and then run. Right? They, they, they're born and they're, they're ready. To, they're born to run those things. A baby can't even uh, feed itself. Totally helpless. The only thing that moves when they're babies is their, is their tongue, pretty much. They can suck. That's the only thing a baby can do for a long time. It's very slow maturation. You did no comparison whatsoever. So these definitions that reside between adults and children are male or female and the differences between there. The reason why there was a, on the books previously a lower age of consent for, for boys is there's a tendency in the um, homosexual male community for uh, pedophilia with young boys. And it's to safeguard against predation and abuse. Anyway, uh, I find it very interesting that the French intellectuals were opposed to ages of consent in the 1970s. And that it was related in some way, I think ways that are, I guess, obvious in Foucault's case, to a sort of a motivated reasoning for attacking languages, language and its limitations and its connection to words. It's an assault on words and the authority of words as it relates to human nature as it's been passed on through generations. I've called these the sexual revolutionaries. Um, but the sexual revolution is passed beyond I'm going to have sex with whoever I want, whenever I want, to legislating it so that there's nothing wrong. We can't determine that it's wrong. There's no way of doing it. In fact, we're going to create laws to include all sorts of acts as a moral enterprise, because the moral enterprise is in accordance with an abuse of power, and we're against abuses of power. I mean, who isn't against abuses of power? But the abuse of power will even be conceived in the determination that this is an adult and that is a child. That's already an abuse of power, according to Foucault. Hence the push against the age of consent. Does this make any sense? And, and in relation to plastic people, he traces it how this use of language away from words towards the spirit and towards intention now has spread into other fields and is affecting society in a broad way so that people even talk about self-identifying and so forth. Self-identification is gaining power over your nature and asserting what you are against the, the discourse of society that will say, you're a boy, you're a girl. Say, no, I am a whatever I am. I'm not a boy, I'm not a girl, I'm a they or a them or a Z or a Zer or whatever. I don't even know the terms. And neither is our prime minister who promotes it because it's impossible to follow. And it can't, be, it can't be determined just by looking at something either or even saying, uh, that's a male genetically, chromosomally, otherwise, like that's, that's a male. That's a use of language to determine a person. And they will say, you cannot determine, they'll talk about uh, the gender advocates will say, that was a, a gender assigned at birth. When they say assigned by the words of another authority, by the, the doctors assigned that person their gender at birth. It was an exercise of power. We should stop exercising power in that way. So children, parents now can determine when their children are born, if they're on board with the Foucauldian discourse analysis, can determine that their child is an other, and then wait till the child gets older, and then the child will determine what sort of other they are. are they, am I a boy? Am I a girl? Am I, am I a unicorn? Who knows what? That's up to the child to self-determine. That's how we prevent the use of power through discourse. That, I'm just broadly, broad brush describing the Foucauldian project here. Is that helpful, informative? Okay, there we go. Anyway, 